Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here with you to, today. Uh, I enjoy presenting these numbers to you. This is your report, and you know you have some great news and some numbers to be really proud of for the uh, year-end period ending in September 30th. These are probably the best numbers you're going to see for, for a long time, I'm, I, I think, because these numbers are pretty extraordinary. But I'd like to go through those numbers in the report, highlight some of the differences between the first quadrant plans, uh, comparing just the plans within TexPERS, what it takes for the best risk-adjusted plans in the, the group, uh, what they've done a little bit differently, and then end with a couple of notes of caution as well. So, Oops. these numbers, um, as I was saying, end on September 30th. And for the dollar weighted averages, you're looking at about half of the allocations are in equities. About a quarter of the allocations are in fixed income and a quarter in alternative strategies. One thing that's uh, really exciting here is on an, a weighted average basis, the TexPERS members have outperformed the 7.3 actuarial hurdle on a 1, 3, 5, 10, and 20 year uh, time period. So really astounding numbers there. The group's weighted average performance has also outperformed a global 60-40 portfolio in all time periods, including the 15-year period. This is just showing a graphic representation, breaking out those numbers. We had 40 plans that uh, responded and participated in the survey this year. We'd love to get that number up uh, for, for next year's if everybody could really turn in your numbers, we want to have as much information as possible for this. It's your report, and we want to make sure we're providing you good information on this. So the breakout of these, this covered uh, about $27 billion worth of assets. You can see the equities were largely broken out almost half and half between uh, domestic equity and a combination of international and global equity. Uh, then you had about a quarter of the portfolio in fixed income and a quarter of the portfolio in alternatives. Here's the breakout of the allocations to alternatives. So one of the things that we've seen is the largest allocations, and this is similar to some of the previous years that we've had, largest allocations are to private equity and to real estate with some exposure to Marketable alternatives, these would be your hedge fund type strategies. A um, little bit of exposure to energy, venture capital, uh, and distressed debt. Okay. This chart just shows the variance of the allocations to different asset classes. So when we're, we're talking about variance, we're really talking about the spread uh, between the, the average and most of the plans. So variance is the square of the standard deviation. So the bigger the number here, the more, um, you know, the outliers are, you know, away from the, the average. And I'll show, tell you the global equity, this is the highest variance for both the active and passive. And this is because on average, a lot of the plans don't have exposure to global equity, but some plans have very high allocations to global equity. This is a chart showing dispersion. So it's another way of looking at this. So instead of it's you know, a standard deviation type number, this is showing the uh, range around an allocation. So the uh, the green triangle shows the average allocations to the various asset classes, and the red and the blue dots show the uh, minimum and maximum exposures. So you can see to the U.S. equity markets, on average, everybody's got pretty good exposure, but there's a really wide range of exposure. 
especially in the active space. So some of the plans, um, as managers have talked about over the last couple of days, they've said there is a big move towards active management being able to outperform passive because the dynamics within the market are changing right now. Those that are allocating more towards active managers may pick up a tailwind and some benefit from that active allocation. And you can see that there's you know, some plans that are entirely passive, and there are some plans that you know, have a very large active exposure. Global um, and international, same thing. You also see some you know, pretty wide dispersion around the, the average numbers between what they have in those exposures. Here, here's the exciting chart I think that uh, everybody's gonna like to see. The one year number for the average uh, performance for the TexPERS plans was 21.5. So, in a, you know, tremendous number for the one year performance. And on three, five, uh, three and five year periods, 10.1%. So, those are great long term numbers. Um, the orange bar there is showing the uh, average actuarial assumption of 7.3%. So you can see that the plans have outperformed the average actuarial assumption in all time periods except for the 15 year period where it's a little under there. But going out to 20 years, the performance has been 40 basis points over the average actuarial assumption. This I think is an even more exciting chart. This shows the performance of the TexPERS plans relative to a global 60-40 uh, benchmark. So the, the blue bars that you see in the front of each time period are the TexPERS weighted average performance. The red bars that you see behind them are a 60-40 benchmark that's 60% uh, uh, weighting to the MSCI ACWI index and a 40% uh, weighting to Bloomberg Barclays Global Ag. So you can see very significant outperformance here for the one year period of 6% going all the way out to 20 years with an outperformance of 120 basis points on a, over a 20 year period. So these are very good numbers. TexPERS as a, as a group should be very proud of you know, the outperformance. We're gonna dig into this a little bit more as I go through these. What we see on, on this chart are the TexPERS plans actually broken out by quadrants. So on a risk versus reward basis, we, we have all the plans that have responded to the survey laid out. When we look at a chart like this, the upper left chart uh, quadrant here is called the first quadrant. That's where you wanna be. That's basically you're taking less risk to produce higher returns. The red square in the middle is the TexPERS average. That's the weighted average performance of the TexPERS plans. The, uh, the green triangle in the third quadrant that you see down there, that is the 60-40 um, MSCI uh, Barclays Global Ag. And then the uh, yellow dot is, the, uh, is a U.S. 60-40 represented by 60% in the Wilshire 5000, 40% in the Bloomberg Barclays uh, U.S. Ag. So now we'll tear into this a little bit more to see what got those plans in the first quadrant. So these plans that, on this chart we show funds that had an overweight to alternatives this is more than 25% in the alternative space. And one thing that jumps out at us is that they're farther to the left. So higher allocations to the alternatives have reduced the risk exposure. And you've got two of the plans that are, you know, first quadrant plans that have that larger al allocation to the alternative uh, investment space. In this chart, 
we're looking at the plans that have over 60% invested in equities. And we can see the impact on this one is that they're, most of them are over to the right of the average uh, risk. So higher equity allocations are driving higher risk numbers for the, for the plans. So when everything's working well for these plans and the equity markets are going up, you should see better performance, you know, bigger performance numbers. When that market reverses and you start to see things go down, that could be exposing, exposing these plans to greater risk of greater downside. These are the chain, same charts showing a 15-year uh, time period. And again, this is with the TexPERS average as the, the center point on this. One thing you can see here is the TexPERS average over the last 15 years has somewhat more risk or volatility than the uh, 260, 40 plans that we compare you against. Um, but has outperformed, again, the 60-40 global, but has slightly underperformed the just a U.S. domestic. So this is telling us that U.S. equity has really been driving a lot of the returns of this portfolio, but that may be about to change as we were hearing from a number of the speakers uh, during the conference. This shows us, again, that the plans that had higher allocations over long term to uh, alternatives, the plans that have over 25% invested in alternatives, were again to the left are showing less risk or volatility than the average tax purse plan. This was a little harder to, to read on a 15 year basis. Uh, plans with over 60% are still kind of to the left and, and right. I think this is because everything we're looking at as a, uh, a sample has a pretty high equity allocation. So not as clear a picture on this one. This is a breakout showing what differentiates a first quadrant plan from the, the plans in quadrants two through four in, in the, the analysis. And we can see that the the first quadrant plans, slightly less domestic equity exposure, but not much of a difference there. Um, the big thing that jumps out is you had a lot of global equity allocation. So they may be picking up some benefit from having rebalancing occur between various markets around the globe. So they, they may be taking advantage of some active management where the active manager can take advantage of one market over another and add some alpha in there. But that's, that's one thing that seems to be jumping out. We also see their fixed income number here is lower than all the other quadrants. So as we've been speaking about uh, during this presentation for the last few years, fixed income right now is mostly risk with very little return opportunity. What we can see with these first quadrant plans is they've scaled down their fixed income exposure and ramped up their alternative uh, exposure as kind of a replacement for that. So their alternative asset exposure is about double what the other plans in the other quadrants have. So alternative assets and that greater global focus seem to be big drivers of the return as well as avoiding some of the pain in the fixed income markets. This is just a breakout in a little bit more of a detailed, how did they you know, manage that allocation to the alternative space? What are their big allocations? And like we saw in the chart earlier on, uh, real estate is the, the largest area that the, the first quadrant plans were allocating to in the alternative investment space, uh, followed by private equity, and then by uh, marketable alternatives, some hedge funds. Some of the other quadrants have, um, you know, some exposures to the alternative space. Um, you know, the fourth quadrant, you know, had some exposure to, you know, the hedge funds. But it's really the, the mix that we've seen worked out really well was the real estate and private equity. One thing I'd say on, on this, it, from the asset allocation, 
we're seeing with those quadrant one plans. Diversification is the first word that you know, comes to mind. There's a greater focus on more diversification, trying to have things in your portfolio that are behaving differently than the other assets. And so looking at other asset classes that may behave differently can continue to drive that better risk-adjusted performance and can be things that the taxpayers' plans can you know, look at. Warren Buffett just bought an insurance company. Insurance is kind of unloved right now, but producing nice cash flows. Um, there's management strategies focused on you know, insurance as an asset class. Uh, long short equity could come back into favor if you're seeing uh, active management begin to, to work better, as some of the, the asset managers have talked about. Uh, greater focus on global equity markets, emerging equity, um, emerging debt. All of those things may add some diversification benefits to your portfolio and allow you to move into that first quadrant. This is just a graphic representation of what we saw in that last one, last chart breaking out the various allocations. But you can see graphically, it's about double the exposure to alternatives in that first quadrant. Here's where we move into a little bit of the notes of caution to, to you know, wrap up the, the, perform, the presentation this morning. We can see that the big driver in the equity markets for the best returns have been North America. Uh, this shows the numbers on a five and 10 year basis and North America has dominated the other equity markets around the world um, with a 16.2% return on an annualized basis over the last five years, U U.S. equity in, in, you know, in particular has been a dominant place to be. These other markets around the world, if you're looking at EFA, which is you know, Europe and Asia, you're looking at just Europe, you're looking at the Pacific, or a world portfolio that includes the U.S., that's the only thing that you know, even comes close because of the, the U.S. exposure, but everything else, world X U.S., and Pacific, Europe, and EFA have performed, you know, half of what the, the U.S. market has done. And it's a similar story on a 10-year basis. So performance has really been driven by U.S.-centric equity portfolios. But as we see on this chart, valuations right now in the U.S. equity market, which is the blue, uh, lines that we see on here are about as high as they've ever been. You know, the only, it's, right now valuations are higher than they were in 1929. They're close to what we saw in 2000. So there is a, a massive amount of risk in the U.S. equity markets. And the debt markets, long-term interest rates, are about as low as they've ever been. We actually saw the low for U.S. Uh, long bonds occurring in March of 2000. At that point, uh, we saw about a 66 basis point yield for the U.S. Uh, long bond. Today, we just saw that go up over 2.65. So there's been a very radical change in the, the bond markets. So this chart is also telling us that whereas historically, a 60-40 portfolio where you had stocks and you had bonds that were kind of serving to reduce the risk may not benefit you the same way that it has historically. There's a lot of risk in the bond markets right now. This is the worst performing bond market in the history of the bond market since they've been tracking long-term treasuries going back to the early 70s. This is as bad as it's been. And We've got a long way to go before things get back into a normal range. I remember well the market declines after 2000, the bear market 2000, 2002, and the bear market in 2007, 2009. And one of the things that jumps out at me as very, very different today than in those periods was where yields were. The 10-year Treasury back in 2000 was at 
So if you had a nice 40% of your portfolio invested in bonds, it created a great buffer for your portfolio. Back in 2007, the 10-year was yielding over 5%. Now we have nothing close to that in, in the 10-year, and we've ended a 39-year bull market in bonds in 2000. So we may have a long way to go towards higher interest rates. You've got a Federal Reserve that is fairly committed to making sure that inflation or high inflation does not become ingrained in the market's mentality or expectations for the markets. The Fed will increase rates significantly over the next year and will put the, the economy into a recession before they allow the mindset to become set that inflation is embedded in this economy. That's a killer for the economy. This shows prior period, a prior period of time when uh, in 2007, where North America was about the worst place you could be in the equity markets. So historically, there are periods when international equity markets do much better. I think we're getting to one of those points where thinking globally, thinking about diversification, and really trying to focus on, you know, good active management, underwriting of assets is going to be the key to generating good stable returns and protecting capital for the future. Um, this just goes through the uh, risk assumptions for the plans generally are, um, the actuarial assumed rate of return is between seven and seven and a half percent for the plans. This shows allocations to domestic equity and international equity. I'll let you guys go through those on your own. This just shows the inflation assumptions for the plans and their actual, this is tied into their actuarial assumptions are generally between two and a half and three percent. Happy to answer any questions if, if you have anything for me at this point. I'll try. Um, along with the strong performance we've seen in the markets, there has been, at the same time, when actuarial assumptions are, are made, people are taking into consideration their inflationary expectations, they're taking into consideration their performance of the various asset classes. So as we see the equity markets become very well-priced and expensive relative to history, our expectations for future returns go down. And so because of those lower expectations, and you've probably seen a lot of your consultants making recommendations that we need to lower our actuarial assumptions, every time you lower your actuarial assumptions, your unfunded ratio is going to go up pretty significantly. So I think that's been the biggest driver of why you're seeing those numbers, you know, not just roll into the bottom line of, oh, we're, we're really well funded. And I think most plans probably use some sort of a five-year type smoothing that is going to also slow or spread out that, that really good news of a 21% return over a few years. Any other questions? <clears throat> I think, you know, one of the challenges that, you know, we've been speaking with <clears throat> TechSpurs plans about is how do we get access to the best managers? So I, I think there's, there's sometimes the challenge 
due to, you know, especially in the alternative investment space, if, you know, you've got managers and it costs $10,000 to negotiate a side letter, it's sometimes a challenge for both the managers to say, well, I'm going to do that for a ten, you know, for a million dollar ticket. And so we, we need to come up with a solution that allows capital to go into the, the best ideas and opportunities. Um, and, and all of those plans just need to work very closely with, you know, a consultant that can help them drive the diversification that we're, we're looking for. And I think passive has been one of the big focuses for, you know, the last couple of decades. It's been more and more passive investing, passive investing, and, you know, it's very hard to beat a passive index. That always is very true towards the end of cycles and it becomes more and more true and reinforced as you reach the peak of a, a market top. So, you know, at the market top, and, and I believe that the equity markets probably topped for the U.S. in November broadly, with the uh, Dow finally topping in the first couple of trading days this year. So I, I think we are probably looking I prob we're probably already in a bear market, and this is my personal view only, but I believe we are in a bear market that started in November, and it's probably going to be a very challenging few years ahead of us. That's a very good point. Um, we haven't, but that is something we can certainly talk with, you know, um, with Art and the leadership of Texpers. If, if that's something that you'd like to see in the future, we'd, we'd be happy to do something like that. <laughs> 